so not just once or twice or even a couple times, but like many times over the past several months, I've had people tell me that they just feel blah, drained, uncharacteristically in a kind of a mental or emotional fog. And I know that feeling. I'm right there with you. Malaise is like a sign of the times, and even that fact feels just, well, tiresome sometimes. The dictionary defines malaise as a general feeling of discomfort or illness or uneasiness whose exact cause is difficult to identify. Which is kind of interesting, really, because there's a slew of glaringly obvious potential sources going on in our world right now, right? We got coronavirus and the new normal of a country that's sort of kind of half shut down. In-person gatherings and meetings that so many of us depend on, no more. No going to movies or concerts, no in-person church services, classes or meetings. Going out to eat feels risky rather than fun. And a third of restaurants are closed anyway, some of them forever. Millions have lost their jobs on and on and on. And there's the election, of course. Right? The, st the stress of endless negative advertisements and the 24-7 news cycle of more lies, more division, both within and without our country. If you pay attention, there are serious, existential, pressing, legitimate Anxiety about the environment, climate change, fires, floods, hurricanes, droughts, pollution, ozone layers, melting ice, deforestation, species extinction, on and on. There's a global refugee crisis going on right now. Sixty-some million people unwillingly, often violently displaced from their homes, refugee camps on, with horrific conditions, no end in sight, not even a hint of a strategy for addressing the problems or the causes of the problems or the needs of these people. And of course, there's fear being propagated from every conceivable direction. Right-wing militias are coming. Antifa is coming. Black Lives Matter terrorists. The right is criminal and violent. The left are liars and destroying the country. Fear the immigrants. Fear the anarchists. Fear the co corporations. Fear the homeless. The drug, drug addicts. The, home, the gun owners. Fear the people who want to take your guns away. Be afraid. Be very afraid. 24-7, these are just some of the things we can actually identify. Going strictly by the definition... If the causes can be identified, that's probably not the cause of malaise, right? Remember, it comes from causes that are difficult to identify. But it does seem to me, and I actually have no data to back this, to back this up, it's just an observation, that the people I know who are most affected by malaise right now, I think are the same people who spend the most time online glued to their news feeds or social media. And I know I've seen this in myself. An hour online when I'm not actively working on something, writing something, or doing some meeting, um, almost always leaves me feeling kind of yucky. I have, like, like I've been dirtied, right? <laughs> Need a shower or some fresh air to kind of shake it off. Several times just this past week when I've been tempted to scroll through some news feed, I've, I've made myself get up and do something else. I have not regretted a single one of those times when I've done something besides scroll. So I've been learning about the psychological effects of social media. And it's troubling, to say the least. We know for a fact that social media usage has gone up dramatically during the pandemic. We know that our news feeds are designed intentionally to create a stress response in our bodies. We know that our news feeds uh, give us a constant stream of conflict and war and trouble and he said, she said, outrage, disasters. What I didn't know, or at least didn't appreciate, 
until I've been looking at this, is just how sophisticated and just how intentional is the manipulation behind social media. Not just in advertisements, but literally everything about social media. The look, the feel, the content, the speed, the timing. Facebook and Google, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Snapchat, TikTok, all the rest of them. These companies, they have, they have teams of engineers and psychologists studying every move we make online, you and me. They know exactly what we click on. They know how long we look at any given image or meme or story or post. They know what we comment on and how frequently and with what social and political bend to it. They know what we shop for and what we buy and how much we spend in a given week, month, or year. They know where we bank. They know what credit cards we use. They know who our friends are. They know who we're connected to and for how long and how often. And they know all this stuff about all of those people too. And this was, this was interesting and weird and uh, telling, really. I learned, I learned that, uh, not from first-hand experience, I learned that Pornhub, the world's largest pornography site, internally rates their videos not on the number of times someone clicks on it or even on how many people watch it, but by how often it's the last video that someone watches on any given visit to their website. I'll let you, let you draw your own conclusions on that one. The documentary Social Dilemma, which was recommended to me by uh, one of our members, Jillian Gleason, last week, and I watched it, up and, uh, and it made a number of really important points. It said everyone should be aware. And this is a great quote. If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. All that stuff they know about you, that's the product. That's the business model. They just want you to think they're providing a service for you to use, and in reality, those platforms were specifically created in order to use you. They use and study positive intermittent response, a phrase from psychology and they use this with the express intention of keeping you scrolling with your mouse or your finger so you don't know when you're going to see something you like. But you know if you do it long enough, you will, in fact, see something that you like if you stay just a little bit longer. They also use something they call in the industry growth hacking. Intentionally, with great care and sophistication, shaping our habits our expectations, even our perception, planting deep in our subconscious, planting these things, these expectations, habits, and perceptions deep in our subconscious so that we don't even know that we are in fact our being and have been trained just like a puppy to keep coming back and keep scrolling. Facebook, Google, Instagram, Snapchat, all of these, all of them, they use extensive Data-driven testing. They make tiny changes in the look, the feel, the layout, the language, the frequency, the reminders, and so on and so on. They use cues, both liminal and subliminal, and they track how often these changes that they make get the result that they want, which is you staying a little longer, clicking on something, sharing something, commenting on something, or whatever else it is that they want you to do. And they are clearly doing this with tremendous success, especially because you and I generally have no idea how much and how intentionally we are being manipulated. It's curious and troubling. The only two industries that describe their clients as users are software and drugs. The only two industries that refer to their clients as users are software and drugs. Here's why I'm diving into this in some detail in a talk that's really about malaise. 
as we spoke about last week, our bodies almost always know and respond to things long before our minds become conscious of them. I have come to believe that a big part of this feeling of disquiet and uneasiness and malaise that so many of us share right now is because our bodies know that we're being manipulated, even if our minds don't. And our bodies are responding to being manipulated. Does that make sense? Like beyond the actual news, the things we know about, elections and coronavirus, climate change and political gaslighting and racial, social, political divisions, among all of these things we should be righteously worried about, I think our bodies are responding to an even deeper level of being intentionally manipulated. And this is no conspiracy theory. Right? This is documented, this is a documented, fantastically successful business model. Again, with you and me and our habits and our behavior as the product. If that's true, no wonder we're feeling malaise, unsettled, uneasy, disconcerted. There's nothing wrong with us. I think we're, we might be having a perfectly healthy, perfectly understandable reaction to being bought and sold without our consent, to, being, to having our self-determination undermined without our knowledge, to having our integrity insulted by faceless corporations who do not care one whit about the well-being of ourselves, our country, or the world we live in, who care nothing except for making a profit. And they do make a profit handsomely. I just have been wondering if malaise might actually be a healthy response to that reality. So here's my suggestion. Rather than wallowing in the malaise, or learning to put up with it, or accepting it as another outrageous new normal, let's, let's see it as a signal. right? See it as a call for change, a red flag from our bodies telling us that there's something we need to pay attention to. Because the antidote for malaise is not distraction or avoidance, or guilt, or feeling sorry for yourself, or wondering if there's something wrong with you. The antidote for malaise is aliveness. That sense of being alive. Like Cornell West said in the reading earlier, hope is about everybody trying to contribute to the push, the motion, the momentum, the movement towards something bigger than them that's better, the good, the beautiful. If you're not in motion... You're a spectator. And like Sean Tan said in the, in the call to worship from Leah this morning, even when feeling utterly uninspired and unreceptive, in that familiar malaise of artist block, there's only one thing to do. Start drawing. Just start. Whatever it is, just put the pencil to the paper and move it. In other words, pick up the phone, call somebody, talk to your friends and neighbors, read a book, go for a walk, write a letter, make a delicious meal, sing something, make something, do something, go outside, do whatever you need to do to get yourself away from the things that are causing the malaise. Take, cha take charge of the things that you do have, in fact, charge of your own life, your own time, your own precious energy. I can't close this uh, any better than to quote the black American mystic writer and minister, Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman. He wrote, Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive then go and do it. Because what the world needs 
is people who have come alive. Amen, friends.